So we can stop watching Fox or CNN or whatever you watch on the Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of TRD Talks Live. My name is Amir Karangi. I'm the founder and publisher of The Real Deal, and I am very happy to have our guest today, Bob Knackle. Bob is a legend in New York City real estate. Some people might think he's too young to be a legend, but if you sell over 2,000 assets in the city, over $18 billion of real estate, if there is some sort of a real estate hall of fame in New York City, I'm sure he'll be there somewhere on the top of the list. Now, before I go on into our, uh, into our uh, conversation with Bob, I just want to say that you know, information is so important. And right now, information is the difference between a good deal and a bad deal. And the way to best serve your clients is to have the best information you can, you can have. And if you are not reading the real deal, if you're not getting at least five stories a month on the real deal, ask yourself, are you really serving your clients? Are you really serving your investments? So please go on to realdeal.com and subscribe and become informed. Bob, I'm so happy to have you uh, on today. We, I want to get right into it. I know that you are out there talking to clients from all over the world, people you've sold for every major landlord, every major developer in the city. You sold for every major institutional investor out there. I want to know right now, has investment from abroad, has that slowed down since the pandemic? I mean, obviously it has, but what's the situation? In what way? Well, first, Amir, I have to say it's great to be here with you. Second of all, after an introduction like that, I wish my mom and dad were still alive to hear that because that was probably the best intro I ever had. So, uh, but you, you deserve it. Definitely. Thank you. But uh, with uh, with uh, regard to foreign investment, I think the interesting thing is we've seen um, institutional foreign investment slow down considerably, and it's not just pandemic driven. The flow of institutional capital from overseas um, peaked during this cycle in 15 and 16. Uh, for sure, and it's been on the downswing since then. Uh, but we, there's still a very significant amount. Was is that mostly because of China pulling back after 2000? That, well, that was a big, big part of it. In 2014, 15, and 16, China was the biggest, uh, the largest of the those investors. But what we're seeing is a steady stream, even since then, for the last few years, of high net worth foreign investors that are in the market. They continue to be in the market. Post pandemic, I think everything has slowed down a little bit just because the market's so opaque. People don't know what the heck anything is worth. And mm -hmm. so we're in that process of trying to determine what it is. But there is absolutely a lot of foreign capital, particularly foreign high net worth investors, families, uh, mm -hmm. individuals. My thinking, that, my thinking is that, look, their, their situation back at home can't be any better, right? And the US is still a very strong place to invest your money. So yeah, no, well, if you look, there, there are a lot of markets around the world where you have negative interest rates. Mm -hmm. So even, even minuscule positive rates are attractive here. Right. So that's great. And then in terms of uh, investors here in the U.S., I mean, obviously you worked with every landlord and every developer, at least in New York City. Uh, what is the general consensus there? Are they just pulling back? Are they waiting to see what happens? Are they looking at other markets? Well, I think, you know, part of the, the issue we're dealing with today is we have... Uh, not only a health crisis, but we have uh, an issue with underlying fundamentals. We have an issue politically. We have an issue fiscally. Uh, so there are, and this has been happening for a while, even pre-pandemic, we've had a lot of New York investors, folks who have historically only bought New York properties, particularly in the multifamily space, that have increasingly been looking at other markets around the country uh, and, and other asset questions. classes. Where are some of those markets that they're looking at? If you look at where all that capital is going, it's going to states that have little or very low state income taxes. Those are the states around the country that have economies that are doing the best. Florida, Nevada, Texas, Tennessee. Those, those are the areas where a lot of the capital is, is going. What does that mean for someone like you? I mean, you do most of your business here in the city and you have clients who are looking at uh, uh, other markets. How are you helping them? How are you still making a living? I mean, I'm not worried about you making a living in your $20 million house, but how are you, like, how are you going to take advantage of that for yourself? Yeah, I, I think that unfortunately I just do work in Manhattan, in New York City. Uh, and uh, so I'm referring to our JLL colleagues around the country, uh, folks that want to invest outside New York, but I'm constantly looking for people that are bullish about the future of the city, and that's been become 
a harder and harder to do, but there are folks who still believe in the future of New York, I still want to invest here, and so those are the folks that we're working with on a daily basis. How do you go out and find those people? I mean, obviously, all the people in this market, they know you, they know to come to you, but for people who are interested to get out of their own, their current markets and come to New York, how do you make yourself available to them? Well, there, there are so many incoming calls all the time. You know, at any one time, we have a, a fairly robust supply of available properties for sale. So folks are coming to us one way or another, either directly uh, through an attorney, their accountant, a friend, um, another broker. Well, I, have, I remember you came to my, I, I, to my class at NYU and you talked to my students and uh, you shared all your secrets of the trade. You were like, this is what you need to do. This is how I do it. This is what works. This is what doesn't work. And then somebody raised their hand and they said, uh, Mr. Knackle, aren't you worried that someone's gonna come and uh, you know, uh, take your playbook and use it against you or compete with you? You were like, you know, the fact of the matter is I even share this stuff with people within my own company and 90% of the people can't, don't have the discipline to follow through with it. So if they no, do, my, God bless my them. broker coach, my broker coach, Rod Santamassimo, is actually writing a book about this very topic. And the title of the book is Knowing Isn't Doing. Right. And so I think knowing is not that big a deal. Actually doing it is. Well, you know, I, I admire the fact that uh, you are one of the top sales guys in the, you know, in the country, definitely in New York City. But uh, you still go and get coached every month. From what I remember, you still go every week, every, every week, week. every That's Tuesday every morning, morning, eight to eight thirty. Absolutely. What has to offer to you? Pardon? What does this guy have to offer to you? I mean, you, you know what? It's a uh, it's another level of discipline. You know, self discipline is very difficult. It's always easier to have a little more discipline uh, when somebody's looking over your shoulder. Uh, but it's also a combination of of getting best practice tips from folks that they deal with around the country. And you know, nobody has all the ideas, nobody knows all the tricks, and there are always new ways. You know, one of the interesting things, and even in the, the post-COVID world, you need to reinvent yourself. You need to uh, figure out new ways to adapt to a changing environment. And that's one of the secrets to success, I think, is always remaining true to your core values, but yet being nimble enough to adapt to a changing environment. And we have a changing environment now, so there are things we're doing differently, we're doing new things, uh, we're trying different things. What, what are and, some, of the, uh, some of the new things that were completely something that was not in your wheelhouse that you're doing today? Uh, well, there are a couple of things I'd rather not get into details about because we're gonna be rolling a few things out that I think are gonna be very innovative and I, I, they're, it's a little premature to talk about. But for instance, one of the things that I, I took advantage of the pandemic to do um, is I would uh, come into town or have moved the family up to Connecticut to the country house, but uh, came into town every seven to 10 days and drove around and walked around and looked at every single building in Manhattan south of 96th Street, mm -hmm. all 27,649 of them. Uh, it took me about 220 hours to do that. It was easy to do because there was no traffic in the city, but if you tried to do that during normal traffic environment, that's probably 800 or 1,000 hours worth of time. Right. So, and what I did, I had tax maps and highlighters, and I, I logged every development site that was currently under construction, every potential development site. Now I have a, a Sanborn map that's 27 feet long, 12 feet wide, that's oh, wow. completely highlighted. And that's the basis of a tremendous amount of great information that we're hoping to uh, convert into some opportunities for, for some us. Some of you brokers who are at home and wondering what's the difference between you and Bob Knackle, he just sort of explained it right now. That's, <laughs> that's the sort of step you got to take to do the kind of business this man does. Bob, you got a lot of clients. You, you represent a lot of buildings. You, only fo you mostly focus on exclusives. Uh, only exclusives. Are, only exclusives. Yeah, I know you're big on that. But what is that? What? How are you like calming the like the anxiety of your clients right now? What are you telling them? How How are you making them feel comfortable about today's situation? Yeah, that that's uh, very challenging. There are a lot of uh, headwinds we have to overcome, uh, and I think the one good thing about New York City is that there is always a market. Uh, there are always people that that want to buy here, so there is always and efficiency within the market and water will seek its level. Uh, there's still, even in today's environment, there are multiple bids on uh, all the properties that we're offering. But uh, what those cap, bids. What cap rate are you seeing for those? I, I, well, I won't quote a cap rate specifically, Amir, because it, it, it changes 
asset class to asset class, product type to product type. I will tell you that cap rates today are higher uh, than they were back in February pre-pandemic. Uh, and the amount that they've gone up varies based on product type. And it's really surprising because interest rates are so low and lending rates are so low, but cap rates are going up. And that's a measure of the risk that's inherently in the market today. It's, also, um, it's uncertain market. So no matter what the cap rate is, you have a political environment right now that, that looks at real estate as sort of a, uh, like an evil or a bad you know, entity. You know? And right. you know, they're going out of their way and they think real estate is too rich. Even though real estate is the largest contributor to the city's coffers, they think real estate is too rich and they're trying to tax it differently and they're trying to put more restrictions on it. And there's more, there's even more stuff coming down the pipe. So how are you sort of calming the anxiety for these guys? You know, well, they sell right now or do they I think a, a lot of folks do have anxiety, you know, collections are, are, are a down vacancies are growing. And uh, so that's one of the, the reasons I didn't answer your question about cap rates is what is a cap rate today? You base it upon what people are supposed to be paying, what they're actually paying, what the rent roll is today, what you think it might be tomorrow. Uh, there's so many different aspects to it. But I think that there is a, a, a sector of the market uh, in any market, whether it's a good market or a bad market, that folks have no choice. They have to sell. Mm -hmm. There are other people who are highly desirous of selling, um, and um, if they're able to get a price they find uh, appealing, uh, they will trade. But what we're, we're focused on mainly today in this type of environment uh, is we're, we're trying to find those folks that uh, are compelled to sell. You saw that uh, there was a ton of money from uh, Japan that came into the market recently into Churchill uh, uh, real estate and about $2 billion that they want to invest in distressed assets. So people are seeing opportunity that like there's going to be some desperate sellers out there. Do you feel like anybody who looked bought in the last five years would fall into that category? I mean, you know, uh, regardless of their like personal status, but like for that project, for the projects that they bought in the last five years, do you feel like those people are going to be under distress right now? Again, it, it really depends on how they capitalize that acquisition. Uh, if they uh, were very, very conservative with their leverage, they're probably fine. Uh, if the asset is over leveraged, they're probably going to have some issues to deal with. So I, I've always said real estate is never bad. Mm -hmm. It's only the amount of leverage you have on it that can make it bad. Nobody was ever foreclosed on that didn't have a mortgage on their property. So um, although with real estate taxes as high as they are today, um, you know, that, that's a, an issue. And you mentioned that, and that is, is certainly one of the big concerns about where we're headed, given what the fiscal constraints that the city is under and what their tax policy might be. We had, uh, you know, pretty much across the board, everybody that I talked to, whether they're here, and I think just as a, you know, as a matter of fact, people outside of the city, they seem to be very unhappy with the leadership in the city, including with the mayors. You know, we have another year with Mayor de Blasio. We are, we're sort of in the situation, you know, for at least another year, year and a half. What, who would you like to see? What kind of a leader would you like to see in office? I'm not gonna put you in the position of saying how horrible the mayor is right now, but what, who would you like to see replace uh, de Blasio? No, look, I, I think that uh, all of us want to feel uh, safe in the city. Uh, we all want to feel like the quality of life uh, is great. I mean, there are a lot of aspects of the city that are challenging, but we deal with them because there are so many great things about the city and some of those great things are not so great right now. So I'd like to see somebody who's a little bit more pro-business, uh, someone who is uh, a little bit more innovative with respect to what can be done. There are, there are city and not being pro-business. I mean, how do you expect to pay for the, you know, for everything in the city not being pro-business. I mean, what's, what's, yeah. what's the alternative? Amir, if you, if you look at, at Long Island City and what happened uh, at Annabelle Basin a year and a half ago, that is just, there's no explanation for that. Can you, can you, uh, can you tell us what happened? Just to, to I, I, I don't want to get into the details, but a very large company wanted to come to New York and create, invest billions of dollars and create tens of thousands of jobs. Um, uh, some... Folks were against that. 
uh, without realizing that it would increase the tax base significantly. Those tax dollars could do so much good in neighborhoods around town. There are so many ways the city can flourish. If you look at, at public housing, for instance, lot coverage is the, the least dense of any properties in the city. The city owns hundreds of acres of land in Manhattan that you could house 10 or 15 times the number of people that are housed on that land. Mm -hmm. And you could, you could get properties back on the tax roll. There's so many different things you could do. I think someone who takes a fresh look at things and realizes that you need to create an environment that people wanna be here to live, wanna be here to work, uh, wanna take advantage of the things the city is, is great at. The yes, funny thing about the Amazon thing is that uh, Amazon is still leasing space all over the city and they're still getting the space that they need. It's not as centralized as they would have liked to have it in Long Island City, but they are still very much active. They're doing what they need, uh, they need to do. So it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. Ed, can you explain the Rublin deal to us? I mean, that happened right in the heart of the pandemic. And uh, it was, you know, it was a record price uh, for Brooklyn. Can you make sense of that for us? Because it, it wasn't even like a, you know, it was, it was like a market deal, right? So it, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand what the motivation for that deal was. Yeah, Amir, I don't, I don't want to talk specifically about any one deal, but I'll tell you the people who are buying today um, and uh, those that have institutional capital behind them, some of that, that, that capital has said, we believe in the future of New York. We believe that the, the, that rent regulation and pro-business, anti-business, these are all uh, cyclical and there's a pendulum and that pendulum at some point will swing back. And if the, the time horizon is long enough for that capital, uh, they believe that they'll be in a very good position. I think you say that about every deal, though. I mean, if you wait long enough, it'll rain or if you wait long enough the sun will come out but uh i mean why do that deal now when you know so many things are going against multifamily? you got the, the virus you got the, the politics of new york why do that deal at market price right now in the middle of the pandemic or at least not try to get a better deal out of it you know what there's some people are counterintuitive and believe that now is the time when when people are fearful and they're they're looking at other types of investments. Now is the time to do it. There are no bad markets for Bob Knackle. Bob, the last major deal I think you did, tell me if I'm wrong, was in April. You did, in fact, two. You did one for $81 million and you did one for $28 million, I think. Uh, have you done other deals you know, in the last several months? We have, uh, we have several. We signed last week. We signed a contract on a development site on the Upper East Side uh, for about $35 million. We signed an $88 million contract in Long Island City uh, on a development site about uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, we have contracts out on a, a site uh, would in Clinton. Most, would, would you say that most of these are happening at the market price or are they going at uh, sort of the discounted price? There's definitely new pricing that uh, has when been established. Pricing, lower pricing. Lower Correct. Price. Yes, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> so, yep. But, okay, well that's, uh, well, that's great. Bob, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to chat with us this afternoon. Thank you for wearing a tie for me. I, I, feel, I feel like- Just uh, for you, Amir. <laughs> I feel like I'm remiss not wearing one. But uh, thank you again. And again, to all, everybody who's tuned in, you gotta ask yourself, if you're not reading at least five articles on The Real Deal, the only site that's focused on real estate news, right? And if you're in real estate in any capacity, where you're an investor, you are a broker, you're an appraiser, whatever you're doing in real estate, if you're not reading five stories a month on the real deal at least, are you really doing the best you can do to feed your family, to feed your business, and to get to do, uh, to do what you need to do to succeed, like Bob Knackle? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bob. Have a great Amir, day. Amir, always, always great to be with you and continued success to you, my friend. Thank you so much, Bob.